Harold Holzer is one of the country's leading authorities on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. He is a prolific writer and lecturer and frequent guest on television. Mr. Holzer is an author, co-author, and edited 46 books. His latest is The Civil War in 50 Objects, written for the New York Historical Society. His other recent volumes include 1863, Lincoln's Pivotal Year, co-edited with Sarah Gabbard, Lincoln, How Abraham Lincoln Ended Slavery in America, the official young adult companion book to the Steven Spielberg film, and Emancipating Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation in Text, Context, and Memory, which Henry Louis Gates Jr. called an essential guide to Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. I should mention that we have a complete list of uh, uh, Mr. Holz's work, and I'll read more about it uh, and, uh, and we have several volumes that are uh, available for sale this evening. I'm sure Mr. Holzer will sign those uh, they will be for sale here at the end of the program. In addition, Mr. Holzer has written more than 500 articles and reviews for both popular magazines and scholarly journals, including Life Magazine, American Heritage, where he served as a contributing editor, Civil War Times, American History Illustrated, North and South, Blue and Gray, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, The New York Times, and The Los Angeles Times. His regular column, Ceasefire, appears in each issue of American Civil War, and he contributes regularly to the Civil War sesquicentennial websites of The New York Times and The Washington Harold Holzer has also written a number of pamphlets and monographs on Lincoln, including Lincoln and the Jews and Standing Tall, a heroic image of Abraham Lincoln. And Mr. Holzer has contributed chapters and forwards to 51 additional books, including Lincoln and His Contemporaries, The Lincoln Enigma, Our Lincoln, and The Mary Lincoln Enigma. He was also an historical advisor on the Steven Spielberg film. Mr. Holzer serves as chairman of the Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation, successor organization to the U.S. Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, to which he was appointed by President Clinton in 2000, and co-chair from 2001 to 2010. President Bush, in turn, awarded Holzer the National Humanities Medal in 2008. Please join me in welcoming A.S. Howard. I'm exhausted listening to the introduction. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful, I guess it's finally fall in New England. Um, and I'm particularly glad to be here because it's been a bumpy road and uh, to get here, and Jim Moran has been very patient and encouraging. I don't know how many people realize it, but I was originally scheduled to be here uh, in the spring, um, and it turned out to be the Boston Marathon. Uh, attack day. And so um, we'll never get past it, but we're you know, chronologically past it, and I've had another opportunity to come. I almost didn't get here this time either because last time it was Amtrak that wouldn't run. Today I was in, this morning I was in Charleston, West Virginia, talking about what they think is much more important than the Emancipation Proclamation which is what happened on the same day, January 1st, 1863, Lincoln signed West Virginia statehood. And that's the big news in West Virginia, I'm sure. Um, uh, and of course, Delta almost did me in this morning, but here I am. And it couldn't be a better time. <clears throat> in April, it was more of the focus on the uh, emancipation, but certainly as we get to the uh, 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, November 19th, at which um, President Obama is scheduled so far to uh, give the sesquicentennial address at Gettysburg. Um, now the park is open again, so he might, he might just do it. But it's a great moment because you consider what I call the, the, the prose and poetry of freedom. The Emancipation Proclamation was the prose. It was the legal document that started or really was part of the process uh, to extend the idea of freedom in America. And uh, since it was so legalistic and so dry, um, it required poetry 
for explication and inspiration in the Gettysburg Address, of course, classically and iconically did that. For a long time, and, and I predicated these talks by saying this, although it's, I think we've come into a different cycle in terms of reputation, but for a long while, the Emancipation Proclamation was not held in the highest regard. Um, when I went to school, it was, I went to early school, it was considered, of course, the seminal uh, second freedom document in America, but it's been assumed by many people since that it was deeply flawed, and, and, and certainly the legalistic language in which it was written was not designed or calculated to help uh, its reputation. Nor was the fact that, as teachers later expounded, it only counted, they argued, in places where Lincoln had no authority and didn't apply at all to places, in fact, where he was considered president of the United States. I think the explanation for that is obvious because it was a military order and it only applied in places in rebellion. But I think that limited reach contributed a bit to a, uh, a decline in the reputation of the proclamation. Um, but I think more than anything else, um, the strange reputation of the proclamation as an incomplete act has something to do with Lincoln's campaign to announce it. And I wanted to deal with that a little bit tonight because reminding um, 21st century people about the, the efforts that Lincoln undertook to, quote, sell this idea of freedom to a country he feared was not able to accept it is important. I know the uh, traditional historiography of the proclamation is that Lincoln was drag kicking and screaming into doing this, that progressives pushed him, pushed him until he finally acquiesced and and executed the order that some people thought he should have done much earlier in the war. In fact, just as vocal as the um, progressives were, and Lincoln liked this idea of leading from behind that I think President Obama likes too, <clears throat> being pushed a little bit and then getting the credit for things in the end. But there is certainly an element in this country of um, um, white voters, Democrats, who did not want the rationale for the war to go beyond preservation of the Union. Jim Moran just showed me a, uh, an 1863 newspaper upstairs in the reading room that has a typical Democratic reaction to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which is he's changing the idea of the war. These soldiers who died that the nation might live, as he put it, died because they thought they were protecting the Constitution and the Union, not that they were doing anything as foolish as arguing that the black and white races were equal. So that's the coalition that Lincoln has. Progressive Republicans who are pushing and conservative Democrats who are pushing back. Um, the context of the proclamation is further complicated because it was born, in a sense, out of military failure. Um, let's, let's, um, Start with April 1862. Congress passes a compensated emancipation bill from Washington, D.C., a piece of legislation that's very much overlooked today, but in its day was heralded as one of the signal achievements uh, on the road to freedom. In fact, when Lincoln signed it, after torturing people for an extra day, um, making people think he couldn't decide. Um, Frederick Douglass wrote in Douglass's Monthly, his newspaper, that it was a momentous act. He didn't even use such praiseworthy language about the proclamation. It was the first time an American president had ever signed any document that limited rather than expanded slavery. And it's still celebrated, actually, as a holiday in Washington, D.C. I don't know how many of you remember, a couple of years ago, our IRS deadline was extended from April 15th to April 17th. And that's because the 15th was a Sunday, but the 16th was DC Emancipation Day. And the IRS is closed on DC Emancipation Day. Some people may like that idea that the IRS is closed. Uh, but it's appropriate that since Lincoln imposed the first income 
I suppose. And then after that, Lincoln signed legislation making good on the platform plank of the Republican Party in 1860, which is the ban of slavery in the Western territories. So you've got two, um, you've got two important acts. All Lincoln needs to continue freedom momentum in this vein of compensated emancipation is for some military pressure on the Confederacy. And General George McClellan, a Democrat, who, by the way, lets it be known to the Lincoln administration that he has no intention of fighting to end slavery. He's on, he signed on to save the Union. That's about it. He didn't do a great job saving the Union, but he wasn't going to do any, may undertake any effort to end slavery. So Lincoln's got that on his mind too. By the way, let me just dwell on it for one second. In an entirely militarized society, as the, as the Union had become, what the generals thought was important. They've got all the guns, you know, and they've got all the soldiers. And Lincoln had made a concerted effort in the, at the beginning of the war to recruit Democrats to command regiments. He wanted Democratic generals. He did not want it to be a Republican war. He needed unity. He only won, you know, 52 percent of the Northern vote. So he needed to get Democrats behind the effort to save the Union. And now he enters this springtime and summer of 1862, concerned that Democratic generals are not going, as McClellan made clear, he wouldn't, not going to fight to end slavery. Okay, so Lincoln then, his next move, he's got D.C. emancipation and he's got uh, Western, uh, the expansion of slavery in the West land. So he calls a meeting, I know this is going to be hard to believe, but there was a day when presidents really called in congressmen and had meetings all the time, not just 11th hour meetings. So Lincoln called in all of the representatives of the border states where slavery was legal where he couldn't touch slavery because it was constitutionally protected. And he called them in and said, look, we, everyone said, and by the way, the reaction to D.C. emancipation was very much like the reaction to um, the new health care plan. Everyone thought it was to the destroy the country, the world, the city, the capital, society. It would never work. Nobody could get the logistics done. It was, I, I find the analog so eerie. And it was, of course, not computerized, it was paperwork, but people thought the paperwork wasn't done right, it was too slow, it was repetitive, people were making money they shouldn't make. It's an interesting object lesson there, but I won't make the obvious political point. Calls in the border state congressman and says, look, we're, we're doing it. It's not easy, it's not pretty, because, you know, we've had to hire professional slave catchers to come in and assess human beings' value. It's ugly, but it's happening and these people are going to be free. Why don't we arrange this program for Maryland, for Delaware, and for Kentucky? And they, they said, but you can't afford it. Sound familiar again? It's gonna bankrupt the country. It's gonna ruin the economy. And Lincoln said the war is costing $2 million a day. If we can do this, if you can make, take this step against the cause of the war, we can end the spending and end the dying and end this national embarrassment of slavery. So they went back and they took a vote and they voted 13 to 2 in the caucus to say, absolutely not. We're not ending slavery. So that's where Lincoln finds himself. Meanwhile, McClellan is marching up, well, I wouldn't say marching, marching implies forward motion, inching up the Virginia Peninsula toward Richmond, building a lot of fortifications not doing very well. This elderly general who we had bested in West Virginia suddenly came to life on the Virginia Peninsula. This fellow Robert E. Lee, and he wasn't very easy to dislodge. Lincoln is, is getting pretty desperate. The momentum for freedom is ended because of the border state vote. And he tells a uh, Mississippian, a pro-union Mississippian named Robert Walker, we are being we have to change our tactics. McClellan is getting whipped on the peninsula. Something has to be done. South's home front labor force is operating without challenge, enabling white people to fight against their government. 
those same people who are working on plantations and in farms can be recruited to add a couple hundred thousand people to our army, and that's the only way we're going to win and save this country. So on July 22nd, Lincoln calls his cabinet into session on a steamy, typical Washington day. And he takes out a piece of paper and says, I have something to read to you. And he reads a very rough draft of a document that does contain the, great, the only great language of the ultimate proclamation that slaves would be then thenceforward and forever free if the rebellious states did not return to their normal relationship with the Union. And here he looks at his famous team of rivals for their support. And in those days, uh, cabinet meeting, the presidents turned to their cabinets almost the way Israeli prime ministers turned to their cabinets. They needed a, a yes vote. It was hard for them to proceed without cabinet approval. Not a single member of the cabinet thought it was the right idea at the right time. This included progressives like Salmon Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, who said, why not just let um, generals free people as they go by because we have a congressional law um, that suggests that we can do that without any further help from you, even though the Congressional Act, the Confiscation Act, relied on the court system to work, and there was no court system in the South, so it was inherently flawed. The Postmaster General, who was a Democrat, said, this is July, in a few months we're having an off-year election, we're having a Congressional election. The white vote will rise up against this administration and will be defeated. Lincoln held his ground until William Seward, considered a stronger anti-slavery man in his day than Lincoln, said, if you issue this proclamation now, so soon after McClellan's disasters on the peninsula, it will be looked at as an act of desperation, as what he called a last shriek on the retreat. And that's what convinced Lincoln to wait. He put the proclamation away in his drawer. He told an artist who later came to paint a, a, a portrait of Lincoln reading the document on that July day. He said, I put it away as you would put away the sketch to me. And it was, for a while, an astonishingly well-kept secret in Washington. Eventually, word began leaking out. Then, in August, Lincoln begins to conduct a campaign that is probably not his finest moment. Um, he decides and he does have a brilliant sense of what we would call public relations. He called managing public sentiment. He convinces himself that the white North is not going to accept the proclamation. There will be a Union victory, and then I'm going to do this, as I told Seward, but it's not going to be sustained. I don't know if I'll be swept out of office by an overwhelming uh, vote for the opposition in the congressional elections, or people will storm the, the, the White House. Someone pointed out that McClellan had, had left word that if, if Lincoln actually acted against slavery, he would march the Army of the Potomac on Washington, to which Lincoln allegedly quipped. Having had a success, he enjoyed marching on Richmond. I'm not terribly concerned about that <laughs> possibility. So what did he do? Well, even as he tweaks the announcement, he decides to conduct a sort of semi-public campaign to assure white Northerners, particularly Democrats, again, you know, almost half of the voters, that he will not be acting if he acts because he feels sympathy for people of color. What he will do will be to win the war, to secure the Union. He can't afford to sound benevolent or philanthropic. It's one of those things that hurts the reputation of the population. So he calls in a delegation of free African Americans to the White House, a, a, a classic good news, bad news scenario. The first time a delegation of African Americans has ever been invited to the president's house. The bad news is what he then said to them. And he walked into the room where they had gathered with an Associated Press reporter at his side, taking notes. So what Lincoln was going to say to them was not just for them, was really at them anyway. It was for the reading public. It was almost like a presidential press conference. There weren't none in those days. And, and Lincoln said to them, 
You're the reason that we have a war. You people of color are the reason white men are at each other's throats. We can never live together in harmony. It's not your fault, it's not our fault. You ought to go where the ban is not upon you. It is better for us both to be separated. And then he went on to detail a plan he had hatched. He had federal funding to organize colonies in Panama, in the, the Santa Domingo. There was always Haiti. And they looked and listened. They, more politely than, than you or I, went back and um, wrote an extremely courteous letter saying that after many generations um, living in the United States, it seemed impractical uh, to consider this. I mean, basically, they were saying between the lines, you know, our people have been here longer than your people. We're not going anywhere. But the idea was floating around and was reprinted in almost every newspaper in the country. Now, we can have another debate, and maybe even in the question and answer period, about whether Lincoln was sincere about colonization. He certainly thought it a good idea when he was a younger man. But he didn't even spend this congressional appropriation. One ship went to the new colony um, near Panama. And when the colonists decided that they didn't like it, he sent the ship back to bring them back. He never spent the appropriation. My, my thought is it was a political ploy. It was a way to get people to think that if he announced emancipation, and of course he was going to, ultimately, if he announced emancipation, that didn't mean you white people who were nervous that we're thinking about an integrated society. Okay, what happens next? The same month, um, Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, anti-slavery man for his whole career, I think gets wind of the, uh, the scoop from some of his reporters who were in Washington that Lincoln, in fact, has written a proclamation and is simply waiting for a military victory to announce it. Well, what does Horace really do? He doesn't leak the story. That would be too obvious. He puts out a vicious editorial attacking Lincoln for not issuing the proclamation. It's called The Prayer of 20 Millions. He says, you know, your administration is strangely and disastrously remiss in not taking advantage of African Americans who want to fight for the union. So Lincoln, who I think is noodling away with a statement, looking for a way to make his views clearer, even if they're not exactly true, turns his statement into a letter to the editor, arguably the most famous letter to the editor, or to an editor in American history. And this too has dogged Lincoln's reputation in history and his claim to be a genuine liberator, or my claim that he deserves the man. He writes famously, to Greeley, my paramount object is to save the Union. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do to save the Union. If I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could save the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I would do it. If I could save the Union by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would do that. That's, of course, what he ultimately did. And then to just show Greeley who was boss, he released the letter to another newspaper first. <laughs> and he released it on a Saturday, sent it to the paper on a Friday, it was published on Saturday, and he must have known Greeley was one of the few papers that still didn't have a Sunday edition. So he made Greeley wait two days to catch up with a letter that ostensibly he had written to him. And when, when Greeley read it, he said, your old Abe is too smart. And then Lincoln learns that the Union Army and the Confederate Army are about to engage in Virginia. Here is the moment that the proclamation may finally find the, the moment stimulated by a federal victory. Well, instead, it's the Second World War, and it's another federal disaster. And Lincoln is absolutely agonizing about what to do next. Um, the Prayer of 20 Millions is out. General John Pope has not uh, come through with the victory that he needed, and he's even forced to reinstate General McClellan as the overall commander of the Union forces. So 
word is beginning to leak out that there's something going on, that Lincoln has something ready. You see it in diaries of the period, in little hints in the newspapers. The Vice President, Hamill Hamill, later wrote in his autobiography, really his son's version of his autobiography, that one day in, in August, he goes up to the President's summer cottage in, uh, outside of Washington. It's now open as a museum. Uh, the President's cottage and the soldiers home on the name of the scene. It's quite a beautiful spot. And he says, I'm going on vacation to Maine. This story is a little strange. We, vice presidents were not particularly close to presidents in those days. You know, they didn't have White House offices. Um, Lincoln might have said to him, I didn't even know you were working in Washington. But <laughs> instead, Hamlin allegedly, according to Hamlin, Lincoln said, no, you're not going on vacation. And Hamlin said, excuse me. And he opened his drawer and said, read this. So Hamlin also learned about the Emancipation Proclamation before it was issued. What's strange about the story is that he finally gives up after the second bull run and goes to Bangalore. Not which is a nicer place in the summer than the soldiers' home outside of Washington. And that's where he is ultimately with the proclamation is issued. So Lincoln has one more public forum before the proclamation can finally be issued. And it's probably the most confusing one of all. It was a visit by a Chicago clergyman who came, as so many people did, either in writing or in visits, to say, I mean, you know, must have like rung up to hear with Lincoln, you really should emancipate the slaves and the Confederacy. And Lincoln said, suddenly almost as an outburst, what good would a proclamation for me do? It would be like the Pope's bull against the common. And he was referring rather arcanely, but you know, smart man, well read man, to a famous Pope papal bull by a Pope, a 15th century Pope named Calixtus who had issued a papal order that Halley's Comet was not to appear in the sky. And of course, the comet disobeyed the next day. But Lincoln did not want his proclamation. The why would my word free slaves? Um, it was a very strange argument. I think it was just a, mo a moment when Lincoln was just beside himself. He didn't know what, was, what would happen. Now, a lot of scholars say that this was a moment in which Lincoln showed that he was off his political game. I don't think so, because he doesn't know when the trigger for emancipation is going to happen. As it happened, this strange discourse is published in Chicago on the same day as the proclamation. But that's not because Lincoln was uncertain. It's because he didn't know what would happen militarily. The Chicago clergymen leave. General Lee marches into Maryland, and of course, the Army of the Potomac engages the Army of Northern Virginia at Antietam on September 17, 1862. So who wins the victory that ultimately triggers the proclamation of all people in its great poetic, political, and historical justice? It's George McClellan, the man who refuses to fight for freedom. It wasn't a great victory. It was certainly costly in terms of human life. It was the single bloodiest day in the history of the American military, certainly overwhelming casualty figures for the time, and not even D-Day, um, the, the June 6th had produced more casualties than this day in Maryland. But it was enough. Lincoln retreats back to the soldier's home, crafts a new document, and on September 22nd, five days after Antietam, and I think he waited because then he, by saying, this is fair warning, the South has until January 1st to return to the Union or forfeit its slaves. It was turned out to be 100 days even from September 22nd to January 1st. Um, I think we then think there was nothing but a simple countdown to the inevitable. But I think there was real anxiety, and here you can park him back again to the, to the dead ceiling uh, crisis. Was it ever going to be breached? I don't know. But there was a lot of anxiety, and there were a lot of people who thought that Lincoln couldn't or wouldn't sign the final order. On December 1st, he, he uh, 
produces his annual message to Congress, akin to today's State of the Union messages, but not delivered in person in those days. Sent up to Capitol Hill and read by a clerk, probably dispassionately. And it's, you know, it had three or four recommendations for constitutional amendments to, again, compensate slaveholders <coughs> in the border states to get slavery out of their areas, too. He even writes in a date certain when he thinks slavery should be eradicated from America. And it's the only time in his entire life that Lincoln writes the year 1900. That is what he thought. That's how long he thought slavery would be entrenched in this country, which is pretty shocking. And then he ends this message with these ringing words, we cannot escape history. Um, in giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. Um, we will be remembered in spite of ourselves in this fiery trial that was absolutely, you know, we shall nobly say we'll mainly lose the last best hope of Earth. Lines that we hear resonating when modern political leaders adapt those great words. So then the month of December, um, the countdown really gets intense. Think, you know, debt ceiling. I know we don't want to forget that period. But the Union loses another battle at Fredericksburg in December. And there is huge anxiety. Again, they were back into the last shriek on the retreat. How could Lincoln issue a final proclamation on January 1st? And there are many people who predict in the press that he won't do it. After all, he's going to declare slavery ended in places that are in active rebellion. It's going to require the military to reorient their goals. Not just going to try to conquer Richmond, but going to conquer territory and liberate African Americans. Does he have the political power to do it? Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned, those off-year elections were a disaster. State legislatures went Democratic. Governors, New York elected a Democratic governor. Um, Illinois elected a Democratic legislature. Um, the political news was bad and the military news was bad. So on New Year's Eve, as Lincoln was approving West Virginia statehood, I'm going to leave that out, I'm sort of programmed to do that now, he gets the, wakes up at 9 o'clock on New Year's Day, and he gets the scroll. He has submitted his proclamation to a scribe. The scribe has printed it in beautiful handwriting on vellum paper. And Lincoln uns unrolls it and reads it. He wants it to be perfect. He gets to the last part of it, just really a template that has been on many presidential proclamations. Something like, um, uh, I hear unto set my hand and cause the seal of the United States to be affixed. And something was wrong. Some words were transposed. We don't know because the copy's gone. And Lincoln said, I don't want to sign it. It's got to be perfect. So wake up the scribe. I know it's New Year's Day. It was probably up late last night. I'm making that part up. Um, <laughs> but it's got to be done over again. And Lincoln goes downstairs to the East Room, where all of the diplomatic corps, all of the officers, the, the, the Union Army High Command who are in Washington, all the members of the cabinet and their wives are assembled for a New Year's reception, the annual New Year's reception. And it goes on for two hours, two hours of greeting. Now, in African American churches throughout the North, certainly Boston, for example, African Americans and abolitionists gab began gathering at midnight, some under the impression that the order took effect at the stroke of 12. And they waited, and they prayed, and they sang their hymns. Nine o'clock, they're still singing their hymns, and Lincoln has sent back the document and gone downstairs. Now, after the first two hours of the reception, the general public was let in for another two hours. I can imagine it's the third reading of the hymn book at this point. One church sent a parishioner to the local telegraph office to send a sort of a what have God wrong test message, because they were certain that the telegraph wasn't operating, or news would have come. Oh no, came back word from Washington, the, the, the wires are in place, no news. Well, no news was bad news. It's now 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Lincoln gets back to his office, and the news scroll is there. There are three people in the room, Secretary of State Seward, John Nicolay, Lincoln's private secretary, 
and Seward's son, Frederick, who is Seward's personal secretary. And in, in this room, on a winter afternoon, probably getting a little dark, not quite as dark as the Spielberg room, because they did have new gas lights. You know, they were very proud of the, the gas lights in the White House. He owns, uh, rolls it and reads it again, and they're all watching. He said, hopefully, he's not going to find a typo or whatever you call it, but it's handwritten. <laughs> he finishes, and he says it's perfect. And he picks up a pen and puts it in the inkwell, and then he puts the pen down. And then he picks it up again and dips it in the inkwell, and he puts it down again. And the witnesses in the room thought, my God, he's actually not going to do it. And finally, Lincoln looks up and says, I've been shaking hands for three hours, and my right hand is almost paralyzed. If I sign now, my signature will appear tremulous, and people will look at this document in a hundred years and say he hesitated. My whole heart is in it. If my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act. So he waited, and he massaged one of those gigantic hands with the other, until he felt he had feeling back in his hand. And then he picked up the pen, wrote it out a very bold Abraham Lincoln, and looked out and said, that will do. Finally, the word went out. On the afternoon, after 18 or 19 hours of waiting in those black churches, and those northeastern abolitionist churches, about this dramatic moment that no one knew. Now, there's a little irony. There are a few ironies there, and I think people who are devoted to the antiquarian society would be interested in this. Of course, the signature that he worried so much about has almost faded into obscurity. You know, it was on vellum paper. We talked about rag paper before and how great that is. This wasn't rag paper. So you can't even see it. It's in the National Archives and um, faded beyond recognition. Right after he issued the proclamation, um, a charity fair in Chicago asked Lincoln to donate his handwritten version to the charity fair. And he did. Um, it was sold for the highest amount of any donation to the fair. And Lincoln was informed that he had won a gold watch for donating the most valuable item. Now, in those days, I don't. I think income tax declaration and gift giving things were a little looser because he was very. He accepted the watch, and he wore it for the rest of his life. He loved it. Um, but you know what happened in Chicago. So that proclamation is gone. It, it went up in flames in the great fire. Now, speak as a proud New Yorker now, if that's OK. You guys have won the baseball thing, so you, don't, you have to let me have this. <laughs> Lincoln um, got another request to donate his preliminary proclamation, the September one, to a charity fair in Albany. Um, Albany was a Democrat of town. He wasn't particularly interested, but he was convinced by um, Thurlow Weed, who was the editor of the uh, pro-Republican paper up there. His son-in-law was running the fair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he donated it, and um, the abolitionist Garrett Smith bought 1,000 chances for the raffle. And this is, you know, interesting statistically. He won. You know, he had a great chance of winning, and he didn't win. And then he sold it to the New York State Legislature in, uh, in, in 1865, the, right after Lincoln's assassination. We joke in Europe that it was our last decisive legislative act. Um, but um, um, it's, it's still there in New York. It survived a, a fire in the New York State Capitol that occurred one week after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, so nobody paid any attention to it. That there was, in fact, a state trooper who rescued the proclamation. I just find it interesting that uh, the document that, whose prose Frederick Douglass thought lacked, as he put it, a Leviticus moment. Uh, there's no proclaimed liberty throughout the land in the legalistic document that has become something of a talisman for freedom as it, as it should be regarded. Um, Governor Cuomo, with my little bit of help, sent it around New York State last year for the 150th of the preliminary proclamation. And the lines were out into the street, uh, which was pretty hard uh, for people to see the, the preliminary document that Lincoln not only wrote in his own hand, 
but took some shortcuts by taking the Congressional Confiscation Act, cutting it out, and pasting in sections, so it wouldn't have to rewrite it. So right in smack in the middle of this three-page document is a thumbprint. You know, he got his thumb in the glue pot. You now kids do, and there has got to be his, because he did the whole document. So we have Lincoln's fingerprint, if anyone, if anyone needs it. The prose is the legalistic proclamation. Lincoln was always worried he needed to dot every I and cross every T to make sure that courts, especially once the union was restored and courts went back into session, did not find anything technically wrong with the action of the commander-in-chief taking a military action against contraband property. But he did provide the poetry, as we know, um, at Gettysburg 150 years ago on November 19th. And in an extraordinary speech that's overlooked because he never gave it, he was invited six months after the proclamation to come home to Springfield, Illinois, uh, and address a rally that was for the Union but against the Republican <coughs> Black troops. And Lincoln wrote a terrific speech, but at the last minute he thought he couldn't afford the two weeks it would take to go there and give the speech and come back. He clearly had Delta reservations too, so he knew that he was <laughs> But he gave the speech to, an, to a friend in Springfield and said, read this very slowly. That's a, the only hint we have about how Lincoln delivered speeches, interestingly. And it was a, a real lecture to those neighbors who were always divided 50-50 Democrat and Republican, never overwhelmingly his friends. A real lecture about their reluctance to welcome black recruitment. He said, you say you will not fight to free Negroes. Some of them seem willing to fight for you. Why should they do anything for us if we do nothing for them? No, he said, he would not retract the proclamation or its call for recruitment of black troops. The promise being made, he said, must be kept. Peace would come, but it would be meaningful only if it could be shown decisively that there was no recourse from the ballot to the bullet. But peace required a peace that was worth keeping for all future time. And he ended with an extraordinary warning to those who he thought were resisting the tide of history. When peace came, he said, and I quote, there will be some black men who can remember that with silent tongue, and clenched teeth, and steady eye, and well-poised bayonet, they have helped mankind on to this great consummation. While I fear there will be some white ones unable to forget that with malignant heart and deceitful speech, they have strove to hinder it. Was Lincoln guilty of deceitful speech in preparing the country for the proclamation? Maybe just a little. But much as he did for what he thought were politically valid reasons to delay and withhold and downplay its nation-changing impact, I don't think Lincoln for a minute doubted that it did have a, a, a nation-changing impact. Nor do I doubt that it was Lincoln, probably alone among the <coughs> political leader of the day with his astonishing skill in public sentiment and in po raw politics, who could have helped Lincoln conservation. Reluctant emancipator? I don't think so. Solo emancipator? No, because Congress did play a role, as did the Republican majority, as did African Americans who fled in such great numbers. But was the emancipation meaningful? I will end with one story from the book that Jim was nice enough to mention, The Civil War and 50 Objects. Um, one of the objects that I wrote about is a little notice sketch that appeared in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper around the time of the Union uh, siege of Vicksburg in late June 1863. The Union took Vicksburg around the time, the same time the Union won the Battle of Gettysburg in July. Um, and what this scene shows is simply a group of African Americans strolling into an army camp. But if you look carefully at the notation that the artist <coughs> wrote so that he could send it to his newspaper and they could engrave it but write a caption that made sense. 
white children were slaves leaving the local plantation and entering Grant's lines for their protection and ultimately their freedom. Who were they? They were Jefferson Davis's slaves. The slaves he still owned in a plantation near Vicksburg. And Davis was not happy when he learned. He said things like, where were my overseers? Where were my people? Well, his people were responding the way probably 500,000 enslaved people reacted. Were the words poetic? No, but they had the force of law and they had the force of changing history. Thank you.